I am more than just a little excited to introduce our next guest. Um, neither of these guys need any real introduction to speak of. We're talking about Oral Hershiser and Jaime Harin. Jaime Harin, of course, is a Hall of Famer, the winner of the 1998 Ford Frick Award. Uh, Oral Hershiser joining us as well, 1988 Cy Young Award winner, World Series MVP, National League Championship Series MVP, 60 innings in a row without giving up a run. Oh, wow. You guys know who these is. The voice of the Dodgers for 64 years, 71 years on the radio. Jaime, it is an absolute pleasure to have you guys here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's uh, delighted to be here. It is great. And my friend Mike Capozio from Rotolo Chevrolet, who we talk about on our show all the time. Mike, it's great to see you again as well. I know that we're going to have a little something going on here in a minute that you and everybody else is very excited about as well. Thank you, Travis. I hope there's no surprises here. For you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll see. I have a question. You know what? In fact, I kind of want to start with you, Mike, very quickly here. You and Oral have had a partnership for a while now. I know people see you guys together on TV. You're a New Yorker. The Dodgers and the Yankees start a series tonight. How's it going to go for you? It can't get any better than this, right? <laughs> I mean, I grew up in New York, Yankee fan. My attachments are Oral Hershiser, Jaime's my friend. I'm a Sandy Koufax diehard. I got bit by the Dodger bug. So. Okay, good. That's good. I, I just wanted to make sure that we're you can getting stay. up on the, right, on, on the right foot. That's good. All right, so let, let's start right here. I was telling Andy this this morning, and the Dodger-Yankee rivalry, Oral, mm -hmm. was what hooked me. So when the Dodgers and Yankees started playing each other in the World Series in the late 70s and the early 80s, I was 10 years old, and right. that's when you kind of really decide whether you love baseball or you just kind of like it. Yep. And I went from just a kid that loved baseball to a kid that hated the the Yankees. <laughs> 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 because seeing Craig Nettles make play after play after play right. at third base and just saying, what, 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 how well, come they been, can't get the ball by that guy? They've been in the World Series 11 times, the most of any two teams. You know, It's gone on from 1941, which Jaime can talk about, from 41 <laughs> all the way to 81. <laughs> and the Dodgers have only won three of those. Uh, what was it? The 55, 63, and 81. And the Yankees have won eight. So hmm. it, there's a historic rivalry here. Uh, if you look at all-time winning percentages of baseball teams, it goes Yankees, the dreaded Giants, and then the Dodgers. And so, yes, this relationship for the Yankees to come to town is a very special time for all baseball fans, but especially for Yankee and Dodger fans. Yeah, it's interesting. We were talking about this, Oral, bef um, before you guys came on. And from my perspective, it feels now more like a marquee event than a rivalry, just in the sense that the stakes between these teams when they've met up, has they've been relatively low, like certainly compared to those times you were talking about, 81, that Travis remembers, mm -hmm. which doesn't make it any less awesome to watch or any less exciting to watch. It just adds, it adds a different flavor to it, or like a, a different spin on it. Like it's, what does it take, I guess, then, from your perspective as somebody who's played, to build a rivalry? Well... You're right. I think it probably is a marquee event, not a rivalry. I think it's a little bit more of a rivalry, and it might become one more now that we have interleague play. But you didn't see the American League team until you got right. to the World Series before, and I think that was one of the reasons we were able to beat the Oakland A's. They didn't know anything about us, and we got to surprise them as the bad news bears coming in to beat them. Uh, I think with this, you have both of the most major media markets. You've got both coasts. You've got the historic tradition that the Dodgers left New York. You've got the Yankees. Yankees continuing their dominance. You've got the new ownership of the Dodgers over the last 10, 12 years that has invested in the stadium, invested in the roster the way the Yankees did during the Steinbrenner years and continue to do now. So both these teams, when they come together from now on in this interleague play or the World Series, it is going to be always interesting because I think both organizations are always going to be headed for a championship that year. And so it is going to become a clash. It is going to possibly become a rivalry. Jaime, when you think of the Yankees, is, 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 you know, calling Dodger games for 64 years was just such an amazing accomplishment. When you think of the Yankees coming to town, do you immediately go to Mickey Mantle? Do you immediately go to Whitey Ford and those guys? Or do you yes. just think of this version of the Yankees? Yes, you know, I have done uh, 30 World Series. And uh, my first one between <laughs> the Dodgers and the Yankees was 1963. Okay. That, to me, it is the greatest World Series from the from the Dodgers standpoint, 
because you know the way that Sandy Koufax, Rysdale, Johnny Pardes pitched that, those those games in that series is unbelievable, and uh, and always you know people are asking me when are the Dodgers going to to meet the, the Yankees again in the World Series? Uh, that, that's everybody is, is looking for that. When you think of that that World Series and that rivalry, do you think of them as the team that you could never get past, or do you think of them as the team that we beat three times? Yeah, well, it was a, a big surprise to see them sweep the series four games. Yeah. It, it was unbelievable. Mickey Mantle was on that team, and uh, Scourin was with the mm-hmm. with the Dodgers. He got a great series, and uh, but uh, the pitching was was superb. You know, Sandy Drysdale, Johnny Padres. It, it was great. Is there? We we have one of those greats sitting in here with us as well. Is yeah. there one that's just you mentioned? You know, he mentioned Mike Pozio is in here with us as well. He mentioned Koufax. There's Koufax. There's Drysdale. There's Hershiser. There's Valenzuela. There's Kershaw. Currently, we got some other guys that are coming through the system all the time. Is there one that's just at the top of the list for you? Well, I think we'll have to be the guy next next to me here. No, no, <laughs> because yeah. he's not talking about ability. He's talking about relationship. <laughs> no, how close okay. we are. He calls me his son. So I I enjoy so much that the eighty-eight year. It was because of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gibson was fantastic. That that lasted only two minutes. Between you know him going to the to the plate, pumping his fists around he, the bases. It was a pretty big bat, was though, Jaime. Drysdale, <laughs> uh, Drysdale was so proud of him yeah. all the time, and and, and I adore Drysdale. Okay, how long did that moment feel to you, Earl? Well, I was pitching the next day, so I started to feel the pressure right away because <laughs> we were going to lose, and I'm like, I'm, our, I'm I've got to get it going. You know, you have 59 scoreless innings, you are, you know, winning 20 games or so, and you're kind of helping the team an awful lot. And we could be down 0-1, and he hits the home run, and I'm like, now the pressure's on. We got to be up 2-0. Well, you can't screw this we up. Are, yeah, we, we are the underdogs, right? Yeah. And uh, so, you know, at any time. When the team got me runs because of what was happening during that year, there was more pressure on me because if you can throw a shutout, if they score you one, the fans expect you to win. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, just get us one. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what Koufax and Drysdale used to say. Right. Hey, guys, get me one, and I got you going. You know, and, and they used to do it. So that was Dodger baseball. Andy, Andy and I were talking about this a minute ago, kind of bringing it back to more th- this Dodger team that we're looking at yes. this year, and especially with what's going on down in San Diego where they went and spent a ton of money. They got a really bunch of good players. And I was making the comparison to your 88 team, Oral, and the, the team that, that you talked about too, Jaime. That that Dodger team in '88 had very good players, but it was not loaded with all stars the way that a team like the Padres are right now. Can you put together a team with just really good players, or do you need to build a team like the one that you were on and the one that you watched? Well, I think Jaime can talk about this from the outside and the inside because he was announcing the games, but he was always in the food room or in the team bus or with us at appearances or different things. So. I think there was a special chemistry there. And and I think there is special chemistry on teams that win. Winning does bring people together. But I think this team came together because of controversy. Mm. This team came together because Jesse Orozco put eye black on Kirk Gibson's hat sure. in the first <laughs> exhibition game of the 1988. Gibby runs off the field and is quitting. He is in the shower, <laughs> taking his uniform off, showering and leaving. I am in uniform, chasing him, going, Gibby, you can't do this. This is L.A. This is not Detroit. <laughs> you know, this is going to be huge news. And and Gibby comes back the next day. We have a team meeting. Tommy and Gibby hold a tremendous team meeting. I think even so spoke. And it just brought us together right then. That You could this, feel in the moment. Yeah. this It's not about talent, guys. We're going to go out every single day and try and win this game for each other. We're going to do everything we can. It doesn't matter if you're hurt. doesn't matter if you're in pain. You know, the stuntmen, as far as our bench guys got together, the bullpen came together with Jay Howell as the closer. Fred Clare was getting hammered in the media before Gibson came because he wasn't making enough moves, and he came out of the PR department. Uh, this team and organization came together in 88 because of being attacked from the outside and attacked from within, and it, it really, that chemistry went throughout the year. How do you think you guys ultimately were able to handle it? Because there's obviously two different ways it can go that – the reaction in that controversy could do you in and implode you. It didn't in this case. I just think because of our leadership, and I th- the two leaders are Tommy Lasorda and Kirk Gibson. And I think that they are fueled by negativity, mm. <laughs> right? They are not fueled by patting them on the back. Tommy is fueled by negativity, 
Gibby was full, full a negativity. He loved to hit. He was a football player, right? No, he loved that grit and determination. And that, you know, Soch loves that. I mean, they're Saxy loved that. Hatcher loves that. So, you know, I fed off that. There were lots of us Maybe. that fed off that energy of we're not supposed to do this. You're talking to a 17th round draft pick that was cut from his high school team till his junior year, cut from his college team till his junior year. So what were they I thinking? have already been through. <laughs> Back oh, I, was, I, was yeah. a, I was a runt. I was a runt. I was a runt. I was six foot, 160 pounds. And all of a sudden, my sophomore year in college, I'm 6'3 and 180 pounds. So, no, I think you're, you're talking to people in that locker room that thrive on it's us against the world. Jaime Harin, Oral Hershiser, Mike Capozio joining us here. I know that you, you were calling Dodger games for a long time. My first introduction to you, Jaime, was when Fernando shows up yes. in the early 80s, and you were spending a ton of time with him. You were uh, serving as his interpreter when he would be interviewed. He is my favorite Dodger of all time. And, and this is somebody that it, it's just it's that combination of an amazing player, an amazing personality. You're a little boy when it starts to happen, and all of these things come together at the right time. And you introduced him, not just to me, but to the entire city as, as kind of his voice. Take me through what that was like. Did you know how special, of not just of a pitcher, but well, of a I, person I, it was? Well, I met Fernando when he joined the Dodgers in 1980. We were in Houston, and uh, he was a member of the, of the bullpen. He had already uh, pitched extremely well with San Antonio. He came to the Dodgers, I think, with uh, something like uh, 32, 1, 32 scoreless innings. So we knew about him, but he was in the bullpen. He wasn't used in Houston. Then we went to Cincinnati. He wasn't used in Houston. Then we went to Atlanta. And the first battle that he faced was uh, Bruce Benedict, the catcher. Fly ball to center field. That was the beginning of Fernando. Uh, then... 81, you know, uh, when Fernando joined the Dodgers, he couldn't speak a word of English. So they use uh, um, uh, some, some ball players as interpreters, and Manny Mota was a coach, so he was helping, helping uh, Fernando. But then one day, uh, uh, Fred Clare came to me and said, Jaime, it's not right to use ball players and coaches uh, doing this on a, on a regular basis. Since you are working for the Dodgers, since you are traveling with the team, could you help Fernando? I said, fine, that would be great. Because up to that point, I was very well known only in Southern California. But then, thanks to Fernando, I was exposed to the whole nation, and they knew in New York who Jaime Herring was, or in Atlanta, or in St. Louis. That helped me a lot, and I think that was of the reasons why I was inducted into the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. Uh, I enjoyed that very much. Fernando couldn't speak much, um, but he was always, always um, ready to, to answer any questions. The only advice that I gave him was, Fernando, you don't have to answer every single question that he asks you. Mm. If for any reason you don't like a question, just very politely tell them, I'm sorry, next, next question, please. That was the only advice I gave him. He, but he never refused any, any, any question. He was really, really, really on top of everything. All right, we're going to continue our conversation with Oral Hershey's and Jaime Harin and Mike Capozio. Lots more to get to. Lots on this Dodger team. Lots on Jaime's amazing career as well. It's all coming up. It's Travis and Slee, and he's in for Slee on 710 ESPN. Yes, Mandy's have been sold out for weeks. The second annual 710 Mandy Awards are in eight days. You've been wanting to go? You haven't been able to get tickets? Well, right now at ESPNLA.com, special reserve tickets are on sale. Go to ESPNLA.com, click the Mandy's logo. You can get your way in. You just got to throw down some cheddar, yo. To the sold-out Mandy Awards right now. Travis and Sliwa with Andy continues for your feel-good Friday. And we are, of course, continuing with the Hall of Famer Jaime Harin, Dodger legend Oral Hershiser joining us here in studio as well. Mike Posio from Rotolo Chevrolet and Jorge Harin, uh, Jaime's son, is here as well. Um, Oral, you're telling me the story during the break about how you and Mike first got into business together. Yeah, Mike was looking for somebody to rep the dealer and do some commercials, and I said I wasn't interested. And he said, what do you mean you're not interested? I said, I'm interested in ownership. He goes, okay. So we had a few more meetings and everything I've done with quote unquote, my brand, mm -hmm. I look for people that are experts and I look for people that have the highest integrity. So in my pet food company and in my investment fund and some other things that I do in car business with lane four, uh, I found somebody in Mike Capozio that has the highest of integrity 
really thinks about his customers, thinks about customer service, thinks about how he's going to sell more cars to people, but at the best price. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't mark things up above manufacturer's suggested retail price. So even during the pandemic, when everybody's marking everything up, he wasn't. And so we sold a lot of cars. Well, I started doing these commercials and people said, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> you're doing these crazy things. You must be getting paid a lot of money. I'm like, no, not really. We're just partners and we're going to make sure that we do the right thing for people. And I love being associated with him. So it's been fantastic to be a partner. Uh, Composio Buick GMC out in Victorville, uh, Chevrolet dealership in Fontana that's unbelievable, Rotolo, sure. and Mike is the dancing man now. <laughs> and then that relationship with Mike led to a relationship with Jaime because Mike said, let's honor Jaime for his fantastic, unbelievable, glorious career. I went to Jaime and said, we'd love to do a spot, a very classy spot, honoring your legacy and everything in your career. And Jaime graciously said yes. And we did that spot. And a certain all all of the community of Los Angeles really appreciated it and uh, we have a surprise since he wouldn't take a a car he wouldn't take anything uh, for doing the spot Mike what's the surprise that we want to give Jaime today well, Jaime we, we have a little check here we have a check here for the Jaime and Blanca Harin Foundation Wow. Wow. Oh, oh. $31,000 check. Wow. Wow. $31,000. My goodness. I am, I don't know, uh, from the deepest of my heart, I want to thank you and uh, all the Lord. So everybody, Jorge, come here. (laughs) Because he is the the head of the the foundation. So Mm -hmm. this check should go to you and to the bank. (laughs) <laughs> I, I can <laughs> make and it I, clear to I, the I bank. I guarantee yeah. it'll go straight to the bank. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we're going to put it to very, very good use. Jorge, we, give us a capsule on what the foundation yeah, does. Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, unfortunately, we lost my mom back in 2019 mm-hmm. during spring training unexpectedly from a heart attack. And my mom was a very, very generous person. And she encouraged my dad, who is equally generous. And they have instilled that in, in, in our family. And we thought, what, what better way to honor her memory than to establish a foundation that will help pay it forward? And we created the Jaime Blanca Jarrín Foundation in 2019, along with our founding partners from Los Defensores, who's a legal marketing network of attorneys that we represent. And they stepped up right away, and others followed. And uh, Oral has been very generous with his time as well. And I got to tell you, though, Oral goes way back to when my brother, my brother Jim passed away mm-hmm. in 1989. Oral made a donation, you know, as a MVP of the World Series. Mm-hmm. They received from Chevrolet, I believe you received a car, and yep. he donated that to us wow. to give, and we turned that into scholarships that we, we, we did back then, and then now with the foundation, we have uh, we just gave out uh, uh, $50,000 in scholarships just this last uh, January. Uh, we're looking to double that as we can. Uh, when we're not giving out scholarships, we partnered up with the L.A. Regional Food Bank and, and distributed and paid for 268,000 mile, uh, meals mm-hmm. during the pandemic period. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're very happy. And now that I've followed, although I retired before my father, <laughs> believe it or not, must be nice. they still scratch yeah. their head. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty busy with this foundation. My, my son, Stefan, my family, everyone, we're involved, and we've gotten great, great support. Well, that is a great story, and Mike, yeah. an incredibly generous uh, donation. Can thank you on, yes. on behalf of thank everybody you, yeah. that benefits from that. Just uh, an incredibly kind thing to do. Yeah, I have to say. First of all, I have to say thank you to Jaime and to Oral because um, when you when you watch these these two guys interact with people, and it's made me a better person to watch how they are with people. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm Again, Mike, thank you, thank them. you very much for your generosity. Thank you, Oral. Uh, Love you. I don't Papa. have enough words to, to <laughs> really express my gratitude. It's it's an incredible gesture and one that is incredibly well appreciated by everybody. I I, I assume that something I read this morning, Jaime, had to have been a mistake. You worked four thousand consecutive Dodger games without missing one. <laughs> yes, it <laughs> was from nineteen sixty two until nineteen eighty four. Didn't miss any game. 
And I stopped my streak because of the Olympics. I, right. I, I moved to the Olympics to be in charge of the production, Spanish radio production of the Olympics. Were there any close calls? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like at any moment, like you're sick, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to make it, travel snafus, nothing? Yeah. No, nothing. Uh, Westwood One was was trying to, to be associated with the Olympics. Mm. And the only thing left was Spanish radio. So they grabbed that and they hired me to be in charge of their radio. We did a fantastic job. Java on this on with the Spanish radio. I did about 56 hours of boxing. I did the opening. I did the closing, and I hired about 12 uh, reporters to cover soccer and on, on basketball and all the sports. So it was a great experience for me. You mentioned that you covered boxing as well. Um, yes, you called the thrill in Manila. Ali yes. Fraser three. Yes, I did that. That one I did a, another great fight between Napoli and Monson in Paris. That was an exciting night, but nothing like like the Manila thriller, Rick Manila. How much time did you get to spend with Ali? Uh, few days, just uh, about five days, I would say. And uh, it was a great experience. It was a very tough work because it was so hot, so hot at the other place where the, the, the fight took over. It was about 20 miles outside of, of downtown Manila. It was raining. It was so hot, unbelievable. Mm. I don't know how they could uh, fight, you know, 10, 12, 12, 12 rounds. Uh, it was unbelievable. It was the greatest, the greatest fight I have ever seen. And I have seen thousands because I did all the, you know, in, in the 60s, it was the, the prime time for, for boxing in Southern California. All the Mexicans uh, champions coming to fight here, and it was unbelievable. But nothing, nothing like a Manila fight. You talked before about you know, introducing Fernando Valenzuela basically to yes. the city, to the world, and now talking about calling an Ali fight, spending time around him. These are great athletes, but they're also icons. You know, they're yes. cultural icons. They're they're socio uh, you know, social justice icons. People who mean something beyond just their sport. What is that like, and do you recognize it in the moment like this is something bigger than the uh, event itself? Uh, I, I think I have an idea of what's going to, uh, to happen. Um, Ali was unbelievable. I met him when he was Cassius Clay. I met him when he came as handing the bag of, of another great champion, a Cuban, uh, Luis Manuel Rodriguez, a welterweight champion. Okay. And... Uh, and uh, and uh, Muhammad Ali was with with the with the with the, the same manager uh, as uh, one of the Peter Duran and other fighters, uh, Angelo Dandy. Sure. And he came and they used to train at the gym at the, at the main street gym, and they used to go there with the camera, you know, to 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 get something. And that's what I met uh, Cassius Clay. Uh, he was from Boyan. He was always talking. And Angela said, he, because he wanted to enter the ring. And Angela didn't want him to enter the ring. She mm. said, uh, 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 Cassius, you, you're not a fighter. You are a, you are a promoter. I want you to become a great promoter. But he wanted to fight. <laughs> and finally, you know what happened. All right, let's. I could do this all day long and talk about all these different <laughs> things, but I want to talk a little bit about the current Dodgers, what we're looking at right now. Yes. Let's come back, talk about the series against the Yankees, some of the guys that we've seen this season, and the Dodgers season that has come together so far that has been incredibly impressive despite having a bunch of setbacks along the way. Just a really, really good start. Is this the tease? The this is the tease. Oh, along. you're probably yes. going to talk about Bobby Miller then. I'm probably going to ask about Bobby. <laughs> I got a Gavin Stone question up my sleeve, too. We got a lot to get to. It's coming up. It's Travis Slee. Andy's in for Slee on 710. ESP on 710 ESPN. Travis Rogers, Alan Sliwa. I already have my hands on my knees and I'm breathing hard. Like <laughs> Travis and Sliwa on 710 ESPN. All right, Dodgers hosting the Yankees for three games this weekend at Dodger Stadium. No better people to talk to about that than Oral Hershiser, Cy Young Award winner, World Series MVP, and Jaime Harin. Nothing less than a Hall of Famer, which I would imagine I've asked this to everybody I meet that is in the Hall of Fame. I ask them the same question. Does that ever get old? Is there anything better than being introduced as Hall of Famer Jaime Harin? No, that's a tops. That's tops. There's nothing. It's like getting the, 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 any, other, any, any other recognition, but nothing, nothing like the Hall of Fame. No way. I, I am in six uh, uh, museums and 
uh, on places like that, but uh, Cooperstown is very unique. And not only in the Hall of Fame, but you've been in the Hall of Fame for 25 years. <laughs> it's, it's not just that they put you in yesterday. You were a 25-year member of the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, Oral, let's talk a little bit about this team this season. Yeah. The Dodgers had what was not a typical Dodger offseason, right? They were fairly quiet in free agency, and the, and the guys that they did pursue were – you know, guys like J.D. Martinez, one-year deal, not a ton of money, Noah Syndergaard and right. situations like that. They kind of sat out the big-ticket guys. And Gavin Lux goes down, Trey Turner leaves, Cody Bellinger is non-tendered, all these things. And it was felt like, at least, okay, let's see what happens. They're exactly where they always are, which is at the top yeah. of the division, best record in the National League. How do they keep doing it? Yeah, no surprise that they're at the top, but uh, Arizona's at right the top. There. They're tied right now. And I think, yeah, April 28th, they were 13-13, and 13, and all of a sudden things started to come together. The offense, you know, was boom or bust at that time. The bullpen was a little bit in shambles here and there. The rotation was hurt. But all of a sudden, really, since that date, uh, the bullpen has found its legs every once in a while for stretches of four and five games, and then they'll have a blip on the screen. You know, the offense all of a sudden smoothed out from the 12-run games to the one-run games to all of a sudden now it's like six to seven runs a game. And I think, in general, the reason the Dodgers are in first place is because of the consistency of the offense. Because if you look across the board of the overall statistics right now, the bullpen is near the bottom half of the league. The starting rotation is near the middle of the pack. So you can't just say it's pitching in defense. Defense. It really has so far been sporadic, good pitching for certain individuals at times, and the bullpen comes together at times. And then it's been a consistent, solid offense with a lot of extra base hits. How important do you think Dave Roberts is in terms of a season like this where entering it, the Dodgers didn't seem on paper as strong as they've been in other seasons? You mentioned the slowish start. It's a long season. Like Dave Roberts get scrutinized a lot sometimes <laughs> yeah. i think for reasons that are fair sometimes for reasons that i think i don't but it's a whole nother show for me to sure. protect dave roberts <laughs> but it's a, but it's a long season yes it is and everything every roster has its challenges right if you have superstars that want to hit third and be in a certain place and want to play every day <clears throat> and if you have guys that uh you know are really expecting to be out there and in the rotation and I don't want to be skipped. I you know, everybody, you know, don't let's not go six man. Those all have challenges for managers. The other challenge that Dave Roberts had this year was a new challenge, a fun challenge. Like we're not expected to be the dominant hundred and eleven win team. And I think he's having more fun this year than in other years because the expectation is different. The expectation is to bring this team together to make sure that they win, to see if they can win. And I think he's having a lot more fun. And I think uh, I think people are having more fun. They're they're having fun with the question mark of Vargas, with the question mark of Altman coming in. And now they're not question marks. They're like part of the team. Mm -hmm. You know, is J.D. Martinez going to be able to do it? Yes, he is. He's unbelievable right now, like a 15-game hitting streak. Is uh, Jason Hayward going to be – is this a reclamation project or is this just, oh, filling a roster spot? Well, he's one of the – strongest players on the team when he hits the ball really hard so this is a lot of fun to watch this team's a lot of fun to watch i mean w w and, and or both uh, this one's for both of you now, guys. remember he's retired <laughs> 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 the secret sauce that i talk about on our, on our show all the time that the dodgers have and, and i'll you, you just mentioned jd martinez it was when a, anybody that wanted him could have signed him right the dodgers did it anybody could have had max muncie the dodgers did it Chris Taylor was kind of that proverbial 4A guy, up and down with the Mariners, never really found a spot that would click. Comes at the Dodgers and not only plays virtually every day, but plays well and become an important part. What is it about the Dodger organization? What is it that they know that they can see? That guy right there will work for us. It might not be working there, but it'll work here. Well, I'm talking regarding especially of the, of the Latino fan base. Mm -hmm. The Latinos love sports. They love baseball, they love soccer, they love boxing, and they follow the Dodgers. You know, when Fernando left the Dodgers, we thought that probably I will lose uh, lots of listeners. Uh, I will lose the, the network in Mexico, and I went there to negotiate a new contract with them, and hope, hoping that they will stay with us, but Fernando has uh, left. So they said, Jaime, we want to continue because Fernando is great, but now we follow the Dodgers. Now we follow the Dodgers, so they stay with us. And that's because the Dodgers really have cultivated the market. They have cultivated the Latino market. The Latinos are, see, when I started with the Dodgers, the Latinos coming to, to the Coliseum was 8%. That's it? 8%. Yeah. Wow. Now, 
Dallas State is between 46 and 52 percent Latinos. It's it's unbelievable. And so my longevity is thanks to the Latino community. Of course, I was very much involved before doing the games as a, as a newsman uh, for for ten years. So I was with the community every single day. They knew me. That's why that has helped me my longevity. It also speaks to why Fernando's number needed to be retired. Oh my god! Because the, because the Dodgers are a different organization culturally and, and in terms of their relationship with the city. If Fernando isn't a Dodger, like they're just they're just different. So his place matters in a way that goes beyond whatever Hall of Fame recognition. It's unbelievable, you know, because he left the Dodgers 40 years ago, and still he is loved by the people. Yeah. And Dodgers tell me, you know, when people say that uh, his picture is going to be shown in the, in the screen or, or we're going to mention this, right away they turn around and look at that, my booth and, and, and they start waiting for Fernando to say uh, anything. It, it's funny because they, they tease me here on the show that when I'm watching the Spectrum Sports in LA and the Fernando Mania documentary comes on, I've seen it a hundred times. I'll watch it a hundred more. I'm just, I, I am in on it a hundred percent because it brings back all of those moments of, of not just feeling like a little kid, but getting to relive something that was so iconic along the way. And you were a part of a, a great deal of that. Yeah, but the Dodger organization, I mean, Fernando was a find, right? Sure. This is a guy who didn't have an electric fastball, but, but they taught, had Bobby Castillo teach him a screwball, and Fernando becomes Fernando. And he had the poise of Julio Arias. You know, he, he was like a Chris Taylor or a Max Muncy. He wasn't cast off to the side, but he was found in another country mm -hmm. when they were there looking at a catcher. And they happened to notice, Mike Brito happened to notice the pitcher. So uh, this Dodger organization, through all of the years, has had an open mind about finding talent, has had an open mind about finding the diamond in the rough. And like you talked about earlier, they, they figure out ways to make people successful. And... I think when some of these guys like the Justin Turners and the Max Muncy's and the Chris Taylor's and the different people you've seen come through the roster, they were trying to kind of match it up with when we have a righty on the mound against us, when we have a lefty on the mound against us. But then they continue to work with these guys, and not only do we mix and match them and make them platoon players, but we can turn them into everyday players and everyday stars and win a championship in 2020. <laughs> yeah, that didn't take long. and the They've just been in it every single year. And, and this is kind of one of the last things I want to ask you. That the It's baseball, right? Went 111 games mm -hmm. last year yep. out in the first round or right. the, their first round against the San Diego Padres. Yeah. This has been a 10-year run of Dodger baseball that is, has been as good as any 10-year run in the history of one of the most successful organizations in baseball. But just that one championship in the 10-year, despite being in the World Series, we know what happened with the Astros. Right. That obviously is a, a factor, too. But can as an athlete, mm -hmm. can you deal with – can you – Except that, and look, it's baseball, and sometimes that stuff just happens. 17 years in the big leagues, I was in the playoffs, uh, I think seven or eight or nine years. I don't know what it is now, but I know that I was in three World Series, and we won one. Yeah, It's two completely different seasons. One is a marathon. The other one is a sprint. One, you need a complete roster all the way down to your 40th man. Even when you toggle in and out of the 40-man roster, you maybe end up using 50 players. The, the other, you need five hot guys. You know, and it might not be your stars that get hot. It might be somebody that's not your stars that get hot. And that's where you go. So I know what the fan base wants in Los Angeles and is expecting world championships. But I never see it as a disappointing season when they make the playoffs, give you that thrill of the win or the loss at the very end. And if they don't make it, it still was a great season. Was the ultimate goal to win the world championship? Yes. But to win one, our leader, Stan Kasten, came from the Atlanta Braves organization where they won division title after division title. I don't know, it was 14, 17 14. years in a row. And I think they won a couple of World Series. Maybe one, one. I believe. Okay, yeah. they won one. But you had a thrill for the season and the playoffs. And I think the fan base would rather have that than have the ups and downs and go for it. And we were the perfect team almost last year with 111 wins in the regular season. And yes, we fell out to the 
to the Padres, who we killed in the regular season. 14 and, and 19, something right. like that. Yeah. So uh, that's baseball. It is baseball. But there are two different seasons, and that's the regular season and the postseason. All right, last thing for you, Earl, and this is something <laughs> I've always wanted to bring up to you if I ever saw you at the Spectrum studio or whatever. <laughs> okay. There is a, a Come cartoon. Come by anytime you want. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to be looking more often now. There, there's a cartoon called Teen Titans Go. Oh, boy. And it's uh, DC and about some of these characters like Cyborg and Robin who – when they were teenagers before they became adult superheroes and they lived together. And Robin notices one day that the other superheroes are not brushing their teeth enough. <laughs> like he, they have bad breath and it's bothering him. And he starts lecturing them about the importance of brushing your teeth, which is the key to good oral hygiene. Mm -hmm. And Cyborg hears the phrase, good oral hygiene, and it sets him off badly. He's deeply offended. Here's why. Brushing your teeth is the cornerstone of good oral hygiene. Good? Good? Oral <laughs> hygiene was the greatest pitcher in baseball history. Nicknamed the Bulldog, oral hygiene was known for his sight frame and fierce competitive spirit. A Cy Young Award winner, three-time All-Star, World Series champion and MVP, he holds the record for 59 consecutive scoreless innings pitch. And you say he was just good! <laughs> My answer machine on my cell phone from now on will be, you have reached, and then I'll, play, and then I'll just play that and then leave a message. Yeah, he absolutely, he is offended at the idea of the great oral hygiene being referred to yeah. as just good. Uh, <laughs> terrific. Well, if I ever retire and am not afraid to embarrass myself, I could be an executive producer on a sitcom I have in my mind, but it, it does definitely relate to I my like, name. I like, to, <laughs> I like to bandy myself yeah. about yeah. Yeah. Andy, as, Andy as a, a writer. Producer. As well, so okay, he yeah. he, uh, he may be somebody you guys be, need to collaborate. I, I don't think the Dodgers would all, no longer employ me once I wrote this <laughs> After, sitcom. Perfect. After. They're never going to employ me, so okay. this is great. <laughs> okay. okay. Guys, I just wanted to say thank you for coming in. Uh, Mike, again, thank you for the unbelievable donation to the Jaime and Blanca Harin Foundation. Yes. Yes. Just an incredibly generous gift. I appreciate our partnership a great deal as well. Always good to see you. Jaime, it's a pleasure, and it's a true thank honor you. to get to meet you. you. And you, I... I, th this is this is a whole nother thing because like we talked uh, about with with fernando valenzuela for me yeah. you were right behind him you were as an important part of me becoming a baseball fan as anybody else i find myself maybe fifth or sixth on your list i think drysdale koufax <laughs> kershaw I, fernando, little before my time then, then i'm Look, there but, Kers Kershaw's but i on appreciate the list. on the air you said i was number two <laughs> drysdale yeah. and koufax you know, i'm old but i'm not that old <laughs> i know we spend money on advertising for our dealership so yes. can i give one last plug about mike capozio and victorville and the capozio buick gmc out there in victorville please come please come see if you're thinking about getting a car I promise you, we will treat you right, and I promise you, you will not pay too much. You will pay the lowest amount you can. I, I, it, that is the reason I am with this gentleman. And, and since joining the dealership, uh, we have sold so many cars to friends of mine. Dino Ebel, our third base coach, bought a car. Uh, Jaime has bought a couple cars. Uh, I bought one two people, weeks ago. You bought one. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, just give us a shot. And I'm saying that because not I want to make money. I'm saying that because I think we can help your family with a lower payment. Oral, thank you. All right, thank nice. you for that. Hi, thank mate. you. Thank you, Mike. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to you. We're back with the dump and super crosstalk. Coming up next, it's Travis Lee, 710 ESPN.